Hello, today I want to talk to you about logical fallacies. So these are some of the topics that I want to talk to you about. What is an argument? What is a logical fallacy? What logical fallacy is not? How do we evaluate logical fallacies? And different types of logical fallacies, and I'm going to give some examples. What is an argument? An argument gives reasons for thinking that something is or is not true. An argument, as you know from modules 1 through 8, an argument always comprises of two parts, premises and a conclusion. So what is a logical fallacy? A logical fallacy is a mistake in reasoning. A logical fallacy is a type of an argument that has either unacceptable premises or premises that are not relevant to the truth of the conclusion. But what is psychologically tempting is that logical fallacies are convincing to us psychologically. Now that we know what a logical fallacy is, it's important to know what logical fallacy is not. Ordinarily, we would say a false statement is a logical fallacy. Or we would say a logical fallacy is you know, outrageous or incorrect ideas. And that's ordinarily true. But in this context, in critical thinking, in philosophy, that's not logical fallacy. Again, a logical fallacy is a mistake in reasoning. You know, this last point raises the question about how to evaluate logical fallacies. Three steps, and I want you to follow these three steps every single time on your practice exercises, on your homework assignment, um, or um, just when you are analyzing it on your own. First, identify the premises and a conclusion. Well, it's an argument, right? A bad argument, but it's an argument. So you have to identify the premises and the conclusion. Second, you got to name the fallacy. And you want to define it, a quote from the textbook. I mean, and the reason that this is important is because if you name it, you define it, then it will um, help you to memorize it or to understand it better. Number three, explain why the fallacy occurs. So let's practice. The first logical fallacy we want to study is ad hominem. In Latin, it means, um, ad hominem is a Latin term. Uh, it means to the man or to the person. So when you make an ad hominem argument or lower fallacy, you're rejecting a claim by criticizing the person who makes the claim rather than criticizing or evaluating the claim itself. Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you an example. We should reject Yoda's argument for life on other planets. Well, why is that? Because he dabbles in the paranormal. Now, Yoda, as you know, is a beloved character from Star Wars. And let's break down that argument. Now, let's break down the argument. Step one, the conclusion of the argument is that we should reject Yoda's argument for life on other planets. And then the reason for that, premise one, Yoda dabbles in the paranormal. Now, uh, when you hear or read this argument, you will notice that something is off. And then the reason for that is that it commits the appeal to the person fallacy. You're rejecting a claim by criticizing the person who makes it rather than the claim itself. And if I ask you why is it, then you will say something like this. Yoda's dabbling in the paranormal has really nothing to do with whether we should reject Yoda's argument for life on other planets. The other fallacy that I want to study is genetic fallacy. Here's the definition. Arguing that a claim is true or false 
solely because of its origin. Now, the word genetic there refers to the origin of where that claim is coming from. Uh, we're not talking about genetics in terms of DNA or anything like that. It's not a biological concept. So here's an argument. We should reject that proposal for solving the climate change mess. Why? Because it comes from big corporations. This is an example of genetic fallacy. Now, I want you to pause the video and then go through each step. Step one, identify the premises and a conclusion. Uh, name it, genetic fallacy. Define it by looking at the definition from the book and evaluate. Tell me why you believe that this argument commits genetic uh, fallacy. Now, the next two are uh, fallacies of competition and division. Now, they are sort of two sides of the same coin. Now, composition says arguing that what is true of the parts must be true of the whole. And then division is arguing that what is true of the whole must be true of the parts. So let me give you an example of composition first. So suppose I say that the parts that make up a car are not heavy or not as heavy as the entire thing. And therefore, the car is not heavy. Now, if you reason this way, and you, you, know, you want to first identify the premises and the conclusion, and then the therefore is obviously the conclusion indicator, right? But, that, but then you'll notice that it commits the fallacy of competition because just because, right, parts are not heavy, it doesn't follow that the car is not heavy. The car is incredibly heavy. The flip side of this is the fallacy of division, arguing that what is true of the whole must be true of the parts. Now, here's an example. Now, we all love Vegas Golden Knights. And, and let's say someone claims that Vegas Golden Knights are the best team in hockey. And I think, uh, as of this recording, I think they are the best team in, at least in their conference, I believe. Um, I might be wrong, but, but um, so therefore, an individual hockey player within Vegas Golden Knights is the best. Well, you can see that that doesn't follow, right? Just because Vegas Golden Knights as the team is the best one, right? Best team in hockey, it does not necessarily follow that an individual hockey player playing for the Golden Knights is the best hockey player. Now, equivocation, equivocation is using a word in two different senses in an argument, right? You're using a word in two different senses in an argument. Now, here's an example of equivocation. I want you to read the passage and then go through the three steps. Step one, identify the premises and a conclusion. Step two, name the fallacy, which is equivocation. And then step three, why you believe that the, uh, that the, that the passage contains the fallacy of equivocation. Well, next, appeal to ignorance, right? Um, arguing that a lack of evidence proves something. Now, I want you to notice that the word ignorance does not refer to um, ignorance as in you don't know, uh, you don't know about a topic or you're kind of ignorant about a particular topic. That's not what it means. What it means is that you're thinking that a lack of evidence of something proves something. That's what, it, that's what we mean by the word ignorance in that context. So let me give you an example of this. No one has shown that ghosts are not real. So, they must be real. Okay, so the conclusion of that argument, they must be real. And then the other sentence is, um, is the, the other part of that sentence is, is the premise. Now, this commits the fallacy of appealing 
to ignorance because just because no one has shown that ghosts are not real, you cannot conclude that they are real. And then, and then I want you to read the second passage and then kind of think about why that particular example also commits the fallacy of, of appealing to ignorance. Now, as you study the chapter, um, you will notice that there, is a, there are several fallacies that says appeal to, right? Appeal to popularity, appeal to tradition, appeal to emotion, appeal to ignorance. So here's a kind of one of those appealing to kind of a logical fallacy. So appeal to emotion says using emotions as premises in an argument. Now, I want you to notice what it does not say. It does not say that you cannot, you, your argument cannot invoke or evoke an emotional response. Because an argument, um, you know, regardless of the logic or the reasoning of it, could evoke or invoke a particular emotion, whether positive or negative. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, when you're making an argument and emotion is the only thing or only reasons for thinking that the conclusion follows, now you have committed the fallacy of appealing to emotion. So here's an example of it. I want you to read this passage and go through the three steps. Step one, identify the premises and the conclusion. Step two, uh, name it, appeal to emotion, define it. And then number three, tell me why you believe that the passage commits the fallacy of appealing to emotion. Now, the slippery slope fallacy says this. You're arguing that taking a particular step will inevitably lead to a further undesirable step or steps. Now, imagine yourself uh, kind of standing on a slope and then just snowed and then there's ice on it. It's very slippery. Uh, kind of, it's a slippery slope. So that's the kind of the metaphor. Now, um, not all slopes are slippery in an illegitimate way. So consider this example. If you raise the speeding limit from, let's say, 65 to 70, there will be more accidents because people are going faster. If you, re, you know, raise from 70 to 75, probably more accidents. 75 to 100, definitely more accidents, right? So in that particular case, however, taking a particular step will probably lead to a further undesirable consequences. Nothing wrong with that. But what we're talking about is a type of an argument that says taking a particular step, but you really have no reason to think that it's going to inev inevitably lead to a further uh, undesirable step or steps. That's the fallacy of slippery slope. Begging the question fallacy states this. You're trying to establish the conclusion by using the conclusion as a premise in an argument. And when you do that, you beg the question. Um, another word for this is circular argument. When you are trying to argue for a conclusion, but instead of providing independent evidence or premises to back up that conclusion, you basically restate uh, the conclusion um, uh, by using uh, the conclusion as a premise. And when you do that, you have committed the fallacy of begging a question. So to conclude, uh, we have learned what a logical fallacy is. It's a mistaken reasoning. We've learned the three steps to evaluating logical fallacies. And I've given you some examples. Now, please do note that um, although I have only discussed a few, uh, the textbook discusses many more. 
And in fact, there are over 200 logical fallacies that have been discovered by philosophers and logicians um, in the past 2,500 years. But just because you learn logical fallacies, there is a tendency to look for logical fallacies when they do not exist. So here's an example of it. I want you to read that example. The correct answer is C. No, there is no fallacy. So that is a legitimate option. But I want you to see, kind of think about why there is no fallacy in that particular example. So I want to end with on a on a on a kind of funny note. Um, so here's a, a a poster that I found uh, online, and and it basically says, "Thou shall not commit logical fallacies." You know, it gives some 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 logical fallacies. Some of them are in the textbook. Some of them are not. And then on top it says Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, the three uh, big philosophers from ancient Greek philosophy.